Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the uh, uh, um, fourth in the series of Enterprise Risk Management Webinars, or EOM as we like to call it, a protect. And uh, today we're going to be looking at one of the most fundamental building blocks of Enterprise Risk Management, which is the risk assessment or risk and control self-assessment as we like to call it. And uh, if in risk management, like myself, you like a good acronym, uh, we generally call it RCSA. It is the focus of today's webinar. We are going to look at the wider element of risk assessment to understand where RCSA sits, but it is, as I mentioned, the real building block of uh, enterprise risk management. We will use analogies as we go through to explain the concepts, and I guess my first analogy would be this is a little bit like your personal health check going to your, um, uh, your medical practitioner uh, once a year and having that review of the risks around your own personal health is akin to the risk and control self-assessment and that's what we're going to be going through today. Now, it gives me great pleasure to uh, share the stage or should I share, say share the screen uh, with my colleague uh, from North America, Terry, and I'll let Terry introduce himself. Terry. Yes, Terry, can you hear me? Hello, Dave. Thanks for telling me to unmute. <laughs> good morning, good <laughs> afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Terry Lee. I head the North American sales operation for ProTech Group. I joined the company uh, earlier this year. I've got about 15 years in GRC, and uh, I'm going to be doing a high-level overview of the risk and control self-assessment capabilities in ProTech DRM as time permits. Thanks, Dave. Fantastic, Terry. And uh, my name is David, and my role is the Chief Research and Content Officer at the ProTech Group. Uh, in terms of what I do, my name is my title is fairly self-explanatory. My passion in life is risk management. I absolutely love risk, and I love risk management. And I have the best job in the world because <clears throat> I get to research where risk management is going next, and to feed that through what ProTech does. I also produce a lot of content. That content manifests itself in training materials. We do a lot of methodology training. Number two, in terms of production of content that goes within our enterprise risk management system. And thirdly, the production of content that is used by our <clears throat> very able marketing team. Now, a quick comment about Protect. Some of you may be aware of us, some not. Now, firstly, the name. I'm one of the co-founders with my fellow partner, David Bergmark and my passion in life is risk management, hence the word protect. My partner's passion is technology within risk management, and he's the tech in protect, and we're 23 years old this year, uh, and um, our focus is really giving a complete risk solution in terms of enterprise risk. What does that actually mean? Well, it really highlights what we believe are the four key components that make up great risk management. And if you get all of these four right, it usually ends up magic happening internally in risk management. The four are number one without any particular order is automation of risk management through the digitization of risk management. And that is our enterprise risk management system, a, a, a wide ranging functional enterprise system that does all of the elements of ERM, including risk assessment, which Terry will take us through a little bit later. Number two is what I call preparing the mental ground, making sure our people's knowledge, culture, and their minds are aligned to doing great risk management. We call that, uh, uh, sorry, oh, that's my number three, that's what we call Project Academy, and Project Academy is really where we do our training. The second one, which I jumped ahead, apologies, is also the importance of embedding the process into the front line of the business. Everyone's a risk manager, and we do that through our advisory team, which is all about implementations to embed this, becoming part of business processes, not as a standalone exercise on the side. <clears throat> and finally, is the uh, jigsaw puzzle that hangs it all together, and that is ProTech Consulting, and that does elements such as risk um, appetite statement development, uh, risk management policy, risk management frameworks, risk transformation, risk maturities, and also governance. And we believe if you can get these four elements right and make them merge together and be seamless, this is when great risk management truly gets embedded across the organization. Now, lastly, we are uh, based in uh, Sydney, Australia, where I'm ringing from. So it's very early, but I have had a good coffee. Uh, we've got uh, Terry, in Santa, oh, sorry, Terry, Terry in the US, 
and we have an um, office in Santa Monica in California and we also have an office for EMEA in London. Now that's plenty about us, we need to get moving now into what we're going to cover today in terms of thought leadership. Before we do that, a little comment on introduction and housekeeping. Just so you're clear, if you can please ask questions as we go in the question box, it will allow us to read those prior to a session right at the end where we're gonna to attempt to answer your questions. So keep them going, keep them posted as we go. Any questions we don't get to answer during the webinar, we'll do a written response to you and that will be sent back to all of you as you are registered and that will also come with a link to a recording of this session if you wish to re-watch re anything or you wish to share it with any of your uh, colleagues and also it will come with a PDF copy of the materials so you don't have to actually write anything down. Also my final plea is right at the end when we shut the platform you will get a, a, a post webinar assessment form. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could take the time to give us a bit of feedback. It will take between one, one and a half minutes because that's very valuable for us into feeding the, into our future webinars. So that's enough about us and admin. Let's get into today's topic, which as I mentioned, was to look at the <clears throat> kind of building block, the fundamental building block of risk assessment. It's often the first thing we do in a enterprise risk management framework development because it gives us a lot of information around our risks and our controls and understanding of our business of that initial phase. Now that again is similar to going to your uh, doctor's checkup, your medical practitioner's checkup on an annual basis for example to get an understanding of what is the state of play within the health of your body, within the health of the organisation. Now, if we think about that, what are the objectives of doing a risk assessment? What are the value adds? I think the value adds are many and varied, but they include the following key ones. Number one, it helps us to identify, understand and document all of our material risks and our related controls. So it's about understanding what is going on in the corporate body and then may be able to document that. Number two, it helps us to assess the level of risk in that uh, department, in that business unit, in that organization. And we can assess that against our personal, or sorry, I guess against the organization's risk appetite. So if you are certain taking risks within your body, you need to weigh it up and say, am I happy at this level of risk or do I want to reduce it? Number three, it increases the level of risk awareness by the business. It makes us more aware of what is going on. Now, in a past life, some 20 odd years ago, I used to do a lot of triathlon. Uh, some of you may appreciate um, the uh, pinnacle of triathlon is Ironman. I've done two Ironman in my life. And what I did learn putting my body through that rigor, I was very health conscious and I used to know exactly what was going on in my body. I could almost hear, feel, listen to things and I'd be jumping onto things very, very early and I was very, very aware of, ri of the risk in my body. Now, the same is true of our organizations, become very risk aware through the risk assessment process. One of the outputs is then management assurance. When I used to get a clean bill of health, it used to be able to make me push harder. And this is important in risk management. Good risk management enables to go faster and push harder and be more successful based on confidence that your base and your health is very good. It also assesses the level of effectiveness of our controls. What are the key controls we have in place to manage those risks? Remember it's called RCSA and the C is control and the A is assessment, so it incorporates controls assessment. It also helps us then identify areas that need help, i.e. what is any issues that we have and what action should we take to improve those. Again, personally, find a problem, what am I going to do to fix that? It allows transparency. Often organizations are not too sure what is going on in their business with respect to risk. This brings it out into the light, into the spotlight. It also helps us to rank and prioritize our risks. We have limited resources to manage a business and that includes managing risk. Which are the most important risks we should be focusing in on using Pareto's analysis, the 80-20 rule. Focus on the top 20% of your key risks and you'll manage 80% of your risk in total. Right, second to last, in some organizations, some jurisdictions, some businesses, we need to satisfy regulatory requirements and actually carry out risk assessment. That might be in the health and safety area, it might be in the privacy area, depending on our regulatory regime. 
And finally, very importantly, and this is where true value really comes from, and that is reinforcing that risk management is actually outcome management, i.e. reinforcing the link between risks and outcomes. Now, I always ask the question in risk management, so what? And so what is what is the value from the investment you're making? And here's 10 real key values from doing great risk assessment. And I've got to be honest, my favorite is actually number 10, to make sure we focus on what risk management really is being outcome management. Now, we are gonna be talking about risk control self-assessment, but it's definitely worth appreciating there are many, many uh, approaches to risk assessment. Now, the source I thought I would use for this is the ISO 31010 standard, which is the one just after ISO 31000, the risk management standard, and it's called risk assessment techniques, and it comes with a free pair of glasses to be able to read the table on the right side. But in that table, tools and techniques, it has a whole range of techniques that you can use for risk analysis. Now, we typically do this by RCSA, which is generally driven by such things as brainstorming and also within brainstorming within maybe a workshop we always often will use checklists particularly around a checklist against the risks that we are picking up and making sure we've picked up all our key risks often includes the analysis of risk using risk bow tie analysis for example and also uses consequence probability matrices now you might tailor your own risk assessment using some of the others here but this is almost like a, a, a buffet list of things you can use. So bear in mind that RCSA is only one approach to doing it, but it's the one we see most commonly used globally as the starting point of risk management. Now, before we get in under section number four here, looking at the methodology of risk control self-assessment, we have to get the foundations right. And the foundations for the process is absolutely key to creating value. And this is all about the way that we name and describe our risks and controls. And the key issue here is a lot of people describe their risks and controls very inconsistently and very poorly. And if we do that, that then feeds into our risk and control self-assessment and we're basing our analysis on very, very poor data. So I want to spend a few minutes really giving you a little bit of insight and guidance onto how to name and describe and call out your risks and controls in a really powerful way so that you don't end up with a lot of data problems feeding into your risk assessment. Now, in order to do this, I thought I would use a real practical example of analyzing a risk so we can un and controls so we can understand all of the parts that make up the complete risk story. And then we can decide how we're going to describe and record our risks and controls in our assessment. I thought I would use an example, a very practical one, and that is an example of a person who works for a power company and the power has gone out and they have to, needing to um, climb up a, a large power pole to fix the equipment at the top so that the supply is reconnected to the customer. Now, the risk that I'm going to focus in on is falling from height as they are doing this process, falling from height. Now, in order to analyze the complete risk story here, we have to start from the beginning. And the beginning in ISO 31000, our risk management standard, it says, risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, which means the starting point of risk working backwards from the end to the beginning is what are our objectives? This is the link to our outcomes, outcome management. Now let's ask this gentleman, what are your objectives? And he may well say, customer service, maintain my well-being and health, and also comply with any regulations that I have to while I'm carrying out this activity. Now to expand the regulations, this is very important. That gives us our compliance obligations and we'll assume it requires the person to wear a harness and a safety hat. These are our objectives, always the starting point. Second step, we then ask, what are the critical things we need to do really well in order to achieve our objectives? We call those critical processes, critical success factors. And these would include such things as the person needing to get up to the required height, to be able to complete the task, get back to ground level safely and wear the required personal protective equipment. 
That is step number two, critical processes. Only now can we ask the question, what risk events exist that could lead to critical processes not being achieved, which means we won't achieve our objective. And as I mentioned, we're gonna pick falling from height. Now we refer to this as a risk event, or in this instance, what we even call at Prosec, the main risk event, the main risk event, as in a risk story, there are often multiple events. This is the main one. It's a very important part of my story. Now, number one, it should be the short name for the risk in your risk register. Number one, so this is the really key element of this risk. It's the short name. Now, what is it? It's the point at which we lose control in this, of the situation. The point at which our day was okay and it's become very bad. And this would be when the person starts to topple and gravity takes effect. It's the point at which we lose control. We call it the main event. Lastly, we then ask why might he fall from height? Root cause analysis. And I've given examples of five causes here from impaired worker down to Moss being on the pole. Now you can notice then we've got four components to this risk and we haven't yet mentioned controls. So this is risk before controls, often known as inherent risk if you, uh, if you recognize inherent risk. Now to complete my story, I now have to add controls on and I've added in six different controls. There they are there. And this highlights that there are five components to risk. There they all are, causes, risk events, critical processes, objectives and controls. And word of warning up front, which I'll clarify later, is a lot of people will call out all five as different risks. They might well, for example, say compliance breach. Compliance breach is an impact on objectives. They might say failure to uh, achieve the required height. That's a failed process. These are not risk events. The risk event is falling from height. They might call out impaired worker. That is a root cause. And they might call failure to inspect and clean up, which is a failed control. Now, each of those five articulations of risk is completely inconsistent with one another. And you need to get consistency. And consistency really should be, uh, in our view, using the main event falling from height. Now, in order to understand how they all fit together, I think a picture paints a thousand words. So I'm now going to draw a picture of all those components based on a timeline. In the center, we're gonna put the short name of the risk falling from height. We then work towards the left by asking, but why or how until the answer is it just is, or it's outside of the person's influence. When we get to that point, we've hit the root causes, let's go. They fall, why they slip? Why did they slip? Human error. Why did the human make an error? Because they were impaired from uh, celebrating too much in their personal life last night. Now that is outside of the influence of the organization, so it would be considered a root cause. Water was on the ground, it rained last night, outside of our influence, therefore a root cause. Slippery pole, moss hazard, again outside of our influence, part of the environment. Next is equipment failure due to manufacturer defect, outside of influence, a root cause. And finally, inadequate process given to the person by their superiors, and they were not allowed to influence or challenge the process, but it was inadequate. So that would now be our last and final root cause. We have just done very quickly what is known as root cause analysis. And this is obviously now creating a picture of the drivers of the risk on the left. We now need to attach this risk event to our objectives, otherwise known as impacts, risk impacts. And we do that by asking, but what next? Until the answer is an impact on one or more of our objectives. So failure to reach the ground level safely, a failed critical process, which means we get injured. One of our objectives has been compromised. Failure to wear the required personal protective equipment, which means we've now got a compliance breach. And our compliance breach is an impact because our objective was to comply with. Failure to reach the required height, which means customer service is compromised, and that would occur in two main ways, and that is our third and final objective compromised. 
Now, if anybody's aware of what I'm subtly doing here, if I put an outline around this diagram, I have what is known as a bow tie, and this is a risk bow tie analysis, which is in what a Protect advocates, and I am particularly a personal fan of this. And it really does articulate a risk in great detail. For those of you that may have missed it, our third webinar was all about risk bow tie analysis, and that is available as a recording via our website. It's also worth noting that on the right we have compliance breach. So this is now where we can link to our compliance management and link our obligations to that compliance breach. We now add on our controls in the appropriate spot. Non-slip shoes, inspections and cleanup, harness, PPE check, safety hat and first aid. Right, now what's interesting here is the obligations relate to a minimum control standard, therefore the obligations not only link to a, a breach of a, 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 a breach of a, a, an objective, sorry, not meeting an objective, they also link directly to two of our key controls, the harness and the safety hat. Now some of you might be thinking this diagram is a little messy. Well, I didn't invent risk, i just here to help you manage it. Now, this is the RC in risk control self-assessment, and for our key risks, we need to understand it at this level to have a, an attempt at assessing it in a practical way. Now, for us, this was built on PowerPoint, but within our ERM system, our, ER, our, our bow tie capability, shows it like this. I just thought I'd give you an example and it shows all of the elements I just discussed and it allows you to develop that in terms of a diagram for each of your key risks. Now, this one is based on falling from height. You may be more from the corporate world, so I thought I would leave you with one that is based on cyber intrusion. Cyber intrusion, you can read it in your own time and this is the inherent risk because there is no controls here. And now we add the controls on and we get the residual risk. And this again is the RC in RCSA. We are self-assessing what we have on the screen here. Now what this highlights to us to summarize all of this is that a risk is made up of a number of building blocks, causes, events, impacts, and controls. Now we make the risk event the center of everything we do the short name for the risk in the risk register, therefore we only have one of them for each risk. That means there are multiple causes that could lead into an event and multiple objectives impacted by that event. So we now get the two ends of the bow tie. We have multiple controls that attach to that risk and we have obligations that may link if a compliance is one of our objectives. An outline around that is the bow tie. Now that gives us the five components of a risk, therefore guidance in terms of what you describe and record as your risks. Name the risk based on the risk event, the main event. Do not name the risk based on impacts. So when you see the word reputation risk, reputation risk is not a risk event, it's an impact. Do not name your risks based on failed processes, such as failure in the payments process. It's a failed process. We're looking for the risk event prior to that. Do not name the risk based on causes. They are attaching to the left-hand side of the risk, such as lack of required talent in the local job market. Do not name risk based on failed controls, such as failure to carry out background checks. They are failed controls. They are not risk events. And make sure you do not call out things that are not controls as controls. And this is a very common issue, which I'll address in a minute. Now, before we move on, we need to understand the types of control that we have and how they impact on our risks, because we're doing a self-assessment and have to understand how our controls have changed our inherent risk to our residual risk. The types of control we have, number one, preventive type controls, and they generally attach to the left-hand side of the risk, near its root cause. Things such as segregation of duties, physical access security, technology access security, a cage around a dangerous machine and the like. We then have detective controls and these are more in the center of the risk and these run on the premise that when a risk develops it gives off data evidence, puffs of smoke, red flags. 
we put sensors in, we identify the evidence, we scale it. If it goes over a threshold, we then act. Such things as exception reporting, smoke detectors, temperature gauges, review and authorization, reconciliations. We then move to the right hand side, and this is now what we call corrective controls or reactive controls. And these operate purely to minimize the damage once an incident has occurred. And we generally include things such as insurance, backups, redundancy, disaster recovery, and the like. Now, as you can appreciate, that when we do a risk assessment, we are assessing the size of the risk, and we typically do that by assessing the likelihood and consequence or impact of the main event, the knot in your bow tie, which is the likelihood of the middle event occurring and the impact if it were to occur. If we now place our controls in their appropriate spots, we end up with preventive controls being on the left, corrective on the right and detective in the middle. Now, detective controls can detect prior to the main event and they can detect after the main event. We at Protect call those early and late controls. Why am I telling you this? Because this helps us understand whether a control reduces the likelihood or the impact of a risk. Now, up to the center of the bow tie, the main event occurring, <clears throat> that is all about likelihood because the main event hasn't yet occurred. <clears throat> Once it has occurred, it's all about impact. This means that when you've got a control on the left-hand side of the bow tie before the main event, it is a likelihood reducing control. And on the right-hand side, it's an impact reducing control, which then gives us the understanding that preventive controls reduce likelihood, so do early detective, late detective reduce impact, and corrective reduce impact. <clears throat> this is very important when we are assessing the degree to which our inherent risk is reduced to our residual risk by the different controls that we have in place. <clears throat> now, one comment I made earlier was that we must make sure in our risk control self-assessment, the C controls are valid controls. And what we suggest is you only record numbers three and four on the screen here, which we call key and non-key controls you do not record minor controls, and you do not call out things that are part of the normal operating environment that you deem to be something that affects a risk, but it is not a control. Now, let me give you a worked example to make this as quick as I can. If I was argue, asking you to drive your motor vehicle uh, 30 miles tonight to a restaurant, and I said to you before you drive, would you negotiate with me to drive without the brakes working. I think most of you would say absolutely not. This would be a key control because it's non-negotiable, non-negotiable. We would not consider running our business without that in place. Uh, technology or tech access security comes to mind. I mean, next question is, would you consider driving your car tonight without the driver airbag working quite properly? Some of you may be saying no way, which means it is a key control. Others might be going, well, yeah, just tonight I would. It's no longer key because you're negotiating. However, we would consider a driver airbag important in an accident. Therefore, it would be negotiable, but important. It would be a non-key control. We would suggest you record both of those. Why do we differentiate? Later on in the methodology, we will be doing controls assurance testing and we believe it should be mandatory to test key controls, but they're discretionary to test non-key. The next one is, would you consider driving without the indicator light working on the windscreen washer bottle? The screen washer bottle. Now that is a control, it's a detective control, but it's so immaterial and not impactful on the risk that we probably wouldn't bother recording it. It gets in the way. And my final example is, would you consider driving your car without one of the circular things on the corner of the car, the wheel? Now, the wheel is part of the furniture. It definitely affects the level of risk, whether you have four or three, but because it's expected to be there in the normal environment and the wheel does multiple things, it definitely reduces the risk, but it also allows you to roll along. We would not call a wheel out as a control. As a result here, do not add one and two as controls in your RCSA, only add your threes and fours. 
Now, in order to bring this together in enterprise risk management, it's very important that our types of risks and so on have a central classification. We call it the risk taxonomy, and the risk taxonomy allows us to create integrated reporting of all our risk information up to the most senior board level of an organization. And this is an example of a risk taxonomy at board level, which comes up with around between 15 and 20 risks. And this is but an example. Now, these are split between financial, operational, strategic, and you've got all of the LEX level down, IT services, third party transaction processing, we would expect to have this as the top 10, 15, sorry, top 15, 20 risks of the board. Now, these are risk event based, and this is why we have them so that all our risks can be named and called out as risk events. Now, you may well also have a cause taxonomy, an impact taxonomy, a controls taxonomy, but that would be generally as you mature your ERM process. Start with an event taxonomy as absolutely core. Now, if we take something like fraud, that's at board level, we need to be able to cascade that down through the business. Therefore, we might split it into internal, external fraud, and then at the more granular level, you'd have the detailed frauds. Now, in an integrated enterprise risk management process and system, you will have these all connected. So someone records a funds fraud, and it automatically uh, aggregates up to internal fraud, all the way up to fraud at board level. And this is what we mean by integrated risk management or enterprise integrated enterprise risk management. So now it brings me to applying this to a risk assessment. And I now want to give it a typical way that we do this. And in our risk assessments, we might well then record the business unit's risk in the way that you want to record it. And we typically use a free form field for that. And I've called it the loss of technical engineers with specialist knowledge as my risk event. I then think about the control I have and I have succession plans. Now, if I leave it there, I've got no way to integrate my risk information to be able to give that aggregated view. My risk taxonomies allow me to do that. So I would now go to my risk taxonomies, my risk event taxonomy, and I would then choose loss of key staff at the lowest level, which would then aggregate up to staff retention, HR risk to operational risk through my taxonomies. My root cause, high demand for skilled staff, if I have a cause taxonomy, would then go up through labor market shortage and external events as an example. I would then link it to impacts, my impacts would be these. We generally don't have a hierarchy because we only have seven, eight or nine impacts. It therefore only needs a list, not a hierarchy. And my controls, I might link to my controls library, succession planning, going up to backups, going up to redundancy controls. Now with all of that covered, I've highlighted the main components of risk. And I'm really interested in what you guys who are online here use or have as your uh, central risk taxonomies and whether you have them at all. And if you do have them, how many do you have? So I'm going to launch the first poll and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer that. <clears throat> and if you can uh, <clears throat> put down your uh, uh, multi-select, <clears throat> excuse me, which ones do you use of these? And I'll give you uh, 20 seconds more to answer that. Okay, five seconds and close. Okay, I'm gonna close and share with you all now. Thank you for being so uh, responsive. And uh, no surprise, 80% events. That's the main one that we use, absolutely. Less on causes, but root cause analysis is very important. So I would suggest you definitely work towards that, those that don't. 52% on controls, we're seeing those develop a lot and about 50% um, having a central impact consequence library. So this is fairly typical, but it'll be get, good to be getting us all up to around 80% for all of them to create that integrated view. So thank you for uh, uh, participating in that, uh, in that um, uh, 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 poll. Now, in relation to our um, levels of risk that we recognize in risk assessment, depending on your methodology, we typically see three levels of risk being identified. Number one is inherent risk. 
Inherent risk is the risk before controls. <clears throat> then we look at the effectiveness of our controls and that gives us our residual risk. And then we look at what our targeted risk is and the gap between residual and targeted are our issues and actions. And that brings us then to our targeted or ideal level of risk. Now that then gives us potential to identify inherent risk, residual risk, targeted risk. You may have another name for it, but I'm going to go straight to our second poll, which is a real quick one, which is which of these do you actually recognise in terms of the, your risk levels? Now I've added expected risk in, which very few people do, but if you happen to recognise expected risk, say that as well, but I'm typically interested in inherent residual and targeted. Again, uh, another 20 seconds or so. Okay. Five seconds, and then we'll close and share. Okay, I'm going to share with you now. And 89% um, residual, fantastic, that's what we have to do. Now, what's really surprised me is that nearly all of you do inherent risk, which has really surprised me because the ISO standard doesn't mention inherent risk and a lot of people thought it was not useful. I'm among friends because we at Protect love inherent risk. We think it's very powerful, but all of you online also agree. So that's fantastic. 24% targeted risk and targeted risk is definitely something you should be thinking about because that really highlights where we have issues and actions to address the gap. But again, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, joining in. Now, with all of that as our base, what I then want to do is move to the actual methodology itself. And I'm just going to run through fairly quickly an example of a framework, and then we'll have a look at reporting and then hand over to, uh, to Terry. Now, we're going to talk about then the risk assessment workshop. And what we typically do is think about who should come to those workshops and who should be responsible for assessment. Now, remember it's self-assessment, so it should be the group of people from the business itself and they are self-assessing. They may be assisted by a risk expert, but the risk expert should not be assessing for them. In terms of preparation, they should prepare <clears throat> and understand what's happened in the previous, say, 12 months, but I've given you a list of items that we typically would look at. We then think about the workshop itself. People often ask how long. I always think <clears throat> the initial workshops are between two and four hours, sometimes one workshop. If, however, you can't concentrate for more than two hours, which is very common, we often split them into two workshops, one identifying the data and number two doing the actual risk assessment. Initial risk assessment is usually quite time consuming, four hours, and then update assessments then take a shorter amount of time when you are just updating and amending for any changes. Now, in terms of the methodology we use, I want you to go back to the person that was falling from heights and think about the logical process from beginning to end. Number one, we should identify the area that we are assessing, business unit, division, whatever it might be. And once we've identified that area of our business, we then identify our objectives. What are our business objectives? From there, we identify our critical success factors or critical processes. This ensures our risk management is linked to our outcomes. This is where that true value comes from. We then identify our risks, and that enables us to think then about what your methodology, inherent controls residual. We then link those to that and that allows us then to do our residual risk assessment and we typically plot that on some kind of traffic light report which we'll have a look at in a second. We then identify whether we need to make any actions to address any gaps between residual and targeted. Those actions then get uh, uh, implemented and that then means we achieve our targeted risk. But that is the logical flow all the way from the objectives of the uh, business all the way down now to achieving the, the desired target risk levels. Now, if you prefer chevrons in your methodology, here it is from one to nine. But rather than reading through that, I think I thought I would give you a worked example. And I'm gonna give you two examples of risk assessment, one on your personal health assessment and the other one based on a business process that involves the payment processing and recording of employee expense claims as a worked example. 
Now, the first one then I'm going to do is what are my objectives in my personal life? I won't read any of this out. It's self-explanatory. I hope you have the same objective as me. In the payment processing of employee expense claims, what are my ultimate business objectives? I would put to you that they are these four objectives here. From keeping employees happy through contractual legal or compliance to managing expenses. They are our objectives. Number two critical functions or success factors. These would be our vital organs. For me, my heart in particular, I'll explain that. In terms then of the critical success factors for achieving our objectives, example, what do we need to do to keep our employees happy? I would suggest we need to do the top four things. Right, pay on time all the way to a simple expense claim policy. Now I'm gonna take pay on time as my example here. We then go to risks, and we have a whole series of risks. My personal one connected with my heart is high cholesterol. On the right side, what could stop me paying on time? What about system outage as our example? System outage, that is a risk event. We then add our controls on. For me, it's statins, otherwise Pfizer calls them Lipitor to reduce my cholesterol. For system outage, it will be six, seven, and eight from a UPS power supply to a backup system. And we've got our four levels there. We now can uh, tie them together, excuse the pun, using bow tie analysis. We have system outage in the middle. We know that that could lead to failure to pay on time, which means our two key objectives are not met. But why did we have system outage? And I've traced it back to people-based cause, uh, system-based cause, and external event-based cause. We now add our controls on and we have now our residual risk. We are now at a point where we can enter it into our risk register and assess it. So we now apply it to our risk register. We've got the description of the risk on the left, supported by the bow tie, our controls. And then we assess the level of risk before and after controls, inherent and residual. We then generally plot that on our assessment and we then have our inherent risk and our residual risk. And then you make the decision of whether your residual risk is at the targeted level or not. And from there, you would either walk away and be happy and assured, or you would come up with an issue and an action. Now, the main value add in that methodology is the linkage to our outcomes. And for my final very quick poll, because it's simply a yes and no answer, do you link your risk assessments to your objectives, yes or no? because this is to me to be absolute key in making sure that it adds value and is engaged by our people. I'll give you another 10 seconds on this because it's such a quick yes, no answer, and then we'll move on. Okay, five and close. I think we're getting a gist of this one. We are pretty close to a 50-50 split. Very encouraging, 60% yes. With the 40%, I would strongly suggest you move to that linkage so that your staff get engaged because it is outcome focused. Okay, thank you. We're now gonna move on to the final comments, which is around reporting and use of the risk control self-assessment output. Now, typically, which I showed in my previous slide, we've got our five by five matrix or seven by seven, which is typically how we show the results of a risk control self-assessment. In, in this example, inherent risk on the left, residual risk on the right. Now, much has been said about the weaknesses of the five by five matrix. So I thought I would just highlight these. Uh, one is what level of risk are you targeting when you assess the likelihood and the impact? Is it the typical example of the risk or is it worst case or something in between? You need to be specific, otherwise you will get inconsistency. There is obviously a level of subjectivity in scoring your risk with likelihood and consequence. And obviously we're trying to reduce that subjectivity by getting as much data to feed into this as possible. What are the number of cells and scales you're going to have? This is 25 cells, a five by five. Do you have a seven by seven, a three by three? How many zones will you have? This one has three zones. Do you want four zones, five zones? How do you articulate your scales for likelihood and consequence? And very importantly, 
some people use the matrix wrongly to assess risk against risk appetite. Now, if using this scale here, you assess risk as red is outside of appetite, light blue is within appetite, amber is close to appetite, that is erroneous and it's wrong because you are assessing all of your risk using the same risk appetite. Now, what we therefore need to think about is this assessment only sizes the size of the risk. It doesn't assess against risk appetite. So I thought I'd give you an example that does. Now, what this does, it takes the matrix we typically use and it gets rid of the colors and instead it uses words from very low to high. We then do the risk assessment but we assess it against appetite. So if we take something like risk number one, we have zero appetite and we've scored it as a two, two, which is low. Low is higher than zero. Therefore, this is outside of appetite and it should be deemed a red risk. Where if we go to risk like number five, we have a high appetite. We score it three, three, which is medium, which means it's well within appetite. So this risk would be green. And what this means now, we've added a second approach, which is to then assess it against risk appetite. Now, that said, we've now got a standalone view of our risk assessment. The ultimate key in integrated enterprise risk management is to be able to create an integrated risk profile by uh, taking our risk assessment, but amalgamating it with all our other ERM processes and data, such as key risk indicators, incident management issues and actions to be able to create an integrated profile. Now, we call that an integrated dynamic risk profile, but we shorten it at Protect to be called risk in motion. And as you can see here, it aggregates all of the risk information against the key risk based on the risks taxonomy. And it then gives us that overarching complete profile where risk assessment is but one of the pieces of information. Now, based on that, we might want to drill down to say COVID-19 risk. We drill down and that gives us the background detail information around what supports that risk assessment. And this truly is a view of ERM in its truest sense with being able to integrate all that information together. And as you can see, the risk control self-assessment is here. And that's as much as I wanted to talk about. So what I'm going to do now is uh, hand over to uh, Terry, who's just going to bring some of this to life. Terry, I'll just make you the presenter and I'll hand over to you. Terry. Thanks, Dave. Please let me know when that's showing correctly. Yes, we can see. We've oh. got, uh, yeah, perfect. That's it. Excellent. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. I'd like to take a few minutes and visualize what Dave was talking about in the Protect DRM software solution. I'm logged in as a second line of defense manager, the chief risk officer, and I can see risk across the entire enterprise. The health scores across the top, reading left to right, give me insight into how I'm doing in my risk management program and what the overall life cycle of risk uh, means to me at this moment in time. Starting with the risk assessment uh, assessment health score, moving across controls, compliance, KRIs, and you can see that actions and audit findings are indicated in red, meaning that something is wrong. It's not simply a question of count. It's about tasks and assignments and things being overdue that will indicate a better or worse risk health score. Down below, my second line of defense risk manager sees the business units and using that same model that Dave just shared with you, starting with risk assessments, moving across to the right, I can see the risk in motion. This item in particular for information technology has an extreme inherent rating and a residual rating of moderate, and that's caused by a number of issues. There are some non-compliance issues, there's some overdue actions, there's some audit findings, and there are incidents that have indicated an estimated direct cost to the organization, a loss of about $75,000. I'm gonna drill into this particular business unit. And what this does is narrow my focus down to one business unit or department. And instead of seeing a list of business units, instead I see a list of those risks that are associated. And this is all part of the life cycle of risk and visibility into my risk profile. Now I'm looking at the IT department's risk framework dashboard. 
I have the same categories or tiles of health scores from left to right, but now I can see more specifically that one of the biggest causes of the, uh, of the lower health score is here in external cyber attacks. Now, before we drill into it, one other point I wanna make about this. This is a way of gamifying risk management across the organization by providing risk owners direct insight into precisely where their risks and their gaps occur, they can work to improve their risks by focusing on, for example, audit findings or actions, things that are indicated in yellow and red. I'm gonna open up this external event, uh, external cyber attacks risk, and this is a representation of what Dave shared with you in slides that gives me the complete picture and the connectedness of risks and controls and assessments for external cyber attacks. I have my matrix diagram up on the left. I can see who the risk owner is and the number of open actions and incidents. Moving down, I have all of the essential information associated with this risk, compliance attestations, key risk indicator information, control information, open actions, incidents, and lastly, audit findings. This goes a little further in its configuration to give me some trend analysis as well, looking at these compliance items over the last six months. This is all completely configurable within the product and you can decide how you want this to display in your implementation. Before I jump into the risk assessment, I wanna to touch on a comment that Dave made about how important it is to organize your taxonomy of risks and controls. In Protect ERM, we do this with libraries, but we have another layer of categorization called tags. It's a very powerful capability in the software that lets us categorize and classify risks and controls and causes in the organization. In this case, I'm looking at a standard multi-level risk hierarchy. I can quickly filter to business and system disruption risks. Uh, and I can also search up here by just typing keywords and find one particular risk that I'm interested in. And if I open that up, I can see it has a name and a description and an owner, it has causes. And down here, this is that important part for categorization, reporting, aggregation, and roll-up. This is where the tags are represented. I also have indications of linkage. Where is this risk used throughout the rest of the ERM program? It's related to obligations, it's related to some scenarios, and it's represented in a number of data sets. The same concepts hold true for controls. I have a control library, and within the control library, I have any number of tags used to classify the control library. They might be by control type, detective, directive, preventive, or reactive, or they could be by specific regulatory obligations or controls from ISO, NIST. Uh, we can filter in the same manner by simply selecting, and that narrows the search of the controls themselves. Let's move quickly over to a risk assessment. I'm gonna open up a risk assessment. And in this case, I'm looking at the major phases of risk assessments. This is an overview of all of the assessments that are going on within the organization where I can quickly see their inherent and residual ratings. I'm gonna filter this down to our cyber example and open up this assessment. And I can see that the form itself is organized into sections. This helps with usability, it helps with training as well. When I open up inherent risk, these are the types of elements that I'm using to conduct my risk assessment. I have a risk that's identified. This comes right out of my library. If I wanna know the details of what it is, I can simply click on the blue icon and I can see the details of the risk and its owner and its tags. I can also connect it to strategy and I can see information about the company's objectives and the impacts that have been classified. I've got information about the appetite level, the owner, risk causes, and the ultimate um, down at the bottom, the uh, inherent risk matrix. Moving on to controls, I have a couple of different methodologies represented. I can conduct control assessments on an individual level. If you have a higher level of risk maturity in your program, 
or I can choose to group them together to simplify the control assessment process for, uh, for my users. I'm gonna move down to the residual risk assessment portion where I can indicate if I'm going to accept or treat the risk. In the case of treat, I can actually create action plans for dealing with the risk, or I can choose to accept it and then document exactly why I chose to accept it. That's a quick walkthrough of a risk assessment. I would be remiss if I did not talk briefly about dashboards and reporting. Give me one second while this loads and we'll take a quick look at the dashboards that Dave represented in slides, but in this case, within the software itself. And it's very simple on the launch pad or landing page of this chief risk officer. All we have to do is click on the dashboard button down here under the risk assessment health score, and that will take us directly into the dashboard for our risk assessments. Now, this will look very familiar to what Dave shared with you in the slide presentation where I have my res residual risk heat map in the left. I have summarized my top inherent risks. I have the risk ratings organized by extreme, high, moderate, and low. I've grouped them by appetite category, assessments and controls. This is an indication of departments that do not have controls associated with their risks. That's a bad thing. And I can also see summaries of things related to the flow of work through my program, risk assessments and actions do in the next 30 days. Then we all know that dashboards are really important for communicating to other people in the organization. Therefore, I can simply export them to PowerPoint. That will download to PowerPoint and allow me to pull these dashboard components into a PowerPoint slide deck or a Word document to use in my management reporting. That is a quick summary of Protect DRM risk and control self-assessments. Dave, I'm going to turn it back over to you, sir. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, what I'm going to do now, we've had a few questions coming through, so we've got a couple of minutes, so I will uh, I will go through those. Uh, while we're doing that, um, the on screen here is uh, my QR code for LinkedIn. Um, on the second slide, we had the QR code for Terry and also my partner in crime, uh, Michael Howell, uh, is uh, working with me. Is His is there as well. We would love to join up with you on LinkedIn, so click away and uh, I'll now answer some of the questions. We've got some great, excellent questions and observations. Uh, a couple, uh, Douglas, you made the comment, the risk matrix does not make sense mathematically. I hear you, I hear you. You cannot aggregate it to find your total risk. I completely agree. And uh, you cannot multiply ordinal numbers. I 100% agree with everything you said then. Uh, best, I think the uh, the matrix and uh, so on is, a, is, a, is an art canvas, is an art canvas. And it's very good where you are starting out. It's very good to deal with non math mathematical people and a lot of board members with great respect who might come from a non you know a quantitative background it's very useful however it's got a lot of shortcomings and I 100% agree Doug Douglas and we're uh, certainly looking at something that we can do to uh, improve that uh, also then a couple of other questions um, uh, will the presentation be shared, Edward? Yes, absolutely it will. Um, I love the comment from Ruben. Uh, I made some suggestions on getting our ARM team to stop documenting failures in the risk register as opposed to risk events. Uh, I agree, Ruben. As soon as I see the word failure or inadequate, I shudder because I know it's going to be inadequate failed process or inadequate failed control, neither of which are risk events. So uh, a great observation. Uh, do you suggest having a non-financial risk taxonomy separate from a financial risk taxonomy, market credit liquidity. Ruben, for us, it is one central taxonomy and at the highest level for most organizations, it is financial, operational and strategic. That would be the typical ones. And then within those, you then drill down, as you said, with financial market credit liquidity, with the operational HR, fraud, technology, and so on. And then with strategic, generally we have strategic decision and strategic execution risk. So my answer would be we have one taxonomy, as Terry showed you then, but it's broken down then into covering financial, operational, and strategic, but great question. Uh, Ruben, another great comment. You've really uh, been going well with your keyboard. We also have a process taxonomy. I mean, a thousand rounds of applauses for having a process taxonomy. That's the holy grail 
the last piece and a lot of organizations don't have that they're not even sure what their processes are but that's certainly something that we do have for a number of clients and I would strongly recommend that you think about a process taxonomy as well uh, do you have online training available Ali yes we do have online training available uh, please make contact with me we have online training available right now in terms of recorded sessions and so on and uh, actually we are working towards a digital experience in Protect Academy over the next 12 to 18 months to be able to deliver uh, a lot of this risk training uh, online through a digital experience. An example of process taxonomies to share, um, maybe Ruben, I don't know whether you and Douglas want to catch up and uh, look about a process taxonomy. Um, I haven't got one to hand Douglas, uh, but uh, it would be around you know, uh, high level down to low level processes as you develop them. Now, interestingly, in July, we're going to be talking about operational resilience, and operational resilience does require us to have process libraries because we are looking at end-to-end -end important business processes, critical business processes, and for those of you that want to join us in, uh, I think it's July, we'll be doing our operational resilience webinar. Now, in the time that I had available, I think I've pretty much covered all the questions. If I haven't, we will come back and uh, answer those by way of a written response uh, together, as I mentioned, with a link to the recordings and a PDF copy of the materials. So that's all the questions covered. All it reminds you to do is to just remind you of what's coming up next. So this is an ERM webinar series. We've already done three. These are available as a pre-recorded session. If you want to go to our website uh, down the bottom there and be able to uh, uh, sign up for those, you can get a recording. Uh, obviously, we've just done the risk and control self-assessment one. And in July, we're doing operational resilience, as I just mentioned. Coming up over the remainder of 2022 and into 2020, 23 are the ones below all the way from key risk indicators down to culture and conduct risk and that will likely take us up to February March of next year and we would love to have you continue on the journey if you are finding value in the sessions that we are delivering. Now finally is uh, first and foremost a huge thank you to all of you for taking up an hour of your precious time. We hope it is valuable and also a huge thank you for my partner in crime Terry uh, for giving us uh, what I have to say was a, 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 a bringing it to life on speed which is a very quick one but I found it extremely clear so thank you um, Terry. If you want to know more about what Protex all about here's our contact details and we would love to start a conversation with you. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Uh, so stay in touch and we hope to see you at future webinars. I would like to sign off now. As I sign off, the post course or post webinar assessment will pop up. If you could please give us a minute or two of your time, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, other than that, wherever you are in the world, have a fantastic rest of your day or rest of your evening and uh, thank you.